Hi everyone, it's Lindy. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're doing another episode of Frequently Asked Fridays. So this is the sixth episode in the series. And if you're brand new here and we're just meeting, hello, my name is Lindy. I work from home as an e-commerce seller and I have a beauty store where I sell merchandise on eBay. My channel is solely dedicated to helping other e-commerce sellers better their businesses. So if videos like that interest you, do make sure to hit the subscribe button and also like this video Video if you're a fan of the Frequently Asked Fridays video series. If you're unfamiliar with this video series, it's all about answering all of your questions and filling these videos with as much information as possible. And the absolute best part of this video series is my partnership with Wholesale Ninjas because every single episode, Wholesale Ninjas gives away a 100 count liquidation lot to one of my viewers that asks a question to be featured in the series. We've already had five winners in the series so far, and at the end of this episode, we'll find out number six. So let me tell you what you need to do in order to qualify to win a liquidation lot from Wholesale Ninjas on the next episode. Down in the comment section, all you have to do is ask me a question. Just put five question marks at the beginning of your question. That way I know that you're entering to win a liquidation lot from Wholesale Ninjas. Now this entry period is a little bit different from the previous ones. You actually have a much larger window to enter because the next Frequently Asked Fridays after this episode will not be posted until Friday, December the 4th. So that means that you have an extra week to enter. Now remember, you can ask as many questions as you want. However, only one of those questions can have the five questions question marks indicating entry because we have to keep it fair folks one entry per person but you have from now until Tuesday, December 1st, in order to enter to win. Before I get into all of your questions, I do wanna take just a minute to thank Wholesale Ninjas and tell you a little bit more about them because they are my partner on this video series. I came across Wholesale Ninjas back in 2019 when I was going full force into sourcing liquidation and I was looking for some of the best companies out there that I could use to grow my eBay store. I stumbled across Wholesale Ninjas in a Google search and I picked up the phone and I called them. At the time, I had a lot of questions about liquidation because I was still very, very new with sourcing that way. And so I picked up the phone and I called them and I asked a whole bunch of questions and they were more than happy to answer every single question that I had. But I ordered a huge test lot. I ordered five different kinds of lots and I was so impressed with what I got that I reached out to Wholesale Ninjas and I asked them for a coupon code for my viewers because I thought that my viewers would like their merchandise as well. And that is how this entire partnership began. It began with me buying from them, reaching out for a coupon, code and the rest is history. So for well over a year, they've sponsored my YouTube channel and I really love what they're doing with the liquidation world. They really do help out all level seller. You could buy a small 100 count box from them or you could buy a truckload from them. They are literally there with sellers every step of their business. I do also have a coupon code for them. It's Lindy25. It gets you $25 off of any lot or pallet site wide. I will go ahead and link it down in the video description if you want to go check out their site. Or you can ask me a question down in the comments below and be entered to win a free 100 count lot from Wholesale Ninjas to try them out. Thank you again to Wholesale Ninjas for partnering with me and sponsoring this video series. Now let's get on with the questions. Gold Tops Rock asks, if you didn't sell on eBay or any other platform, what would you do? So I was thinking about doing a video talking about how I am a horrible employee. No, I really am. I'm like the worst employee ever. Now, I guess I could say I am a good employee because I have been fast tracked to management in every job I've ever had. In the hospitality industry, in the food industry, I've always held a management title. I've been the office manager of the most popular bar in Aggieville, which if you don't know what Aggieville is, K-State, the K-State football team, K-State University. Uh, Aggieville is like a bar central. I was the office manager at the most popular bar there. I was the executive assistant to the vice president of operations of a division of IHG hotels, which if you don't know IHG, they operate a lot of different hotels across the United States, like the Ramada, Holiday Inn, Holiday Inn Expresses. And I ended up going from being the executive assistant to VP of operations to actually being general manager of a Holiday Inn Express. And I quit because 
I just don't like working for other people. So I guess that's what I mean when I say I'm a bad employee. I guess I'm a good employee. I do a good job. I always accelerate in my positions, whatever job I had, but I was just never happy working for somebody else. So if I wasn't selling merchandise online, if I didn't have a YouTube channel, if I wasn't doing social media, I would probably still be an entrepreneur and I would be a photographer. For a few years, I worked for a corporate photography studio and I really loved taking photos. And the kind of photos that I would probably specialize in would be kind of boudoir style photos. Kind of like, you know, you imagine glamour shots. I would want to take like glamour shots photos, <laughs> but not that cringy, not that cringy. But you know what I mean by boudoir kind of photos or senior photos. I remember when I had my senior pictures done in high school, the photographer that did it, she was her own business and I really loved how she did what she wanted and I just, I've always loved cameras and photography. I took photography classes in school. So if I wasn't selling things online, I would be a photographer running my own business out of my house. Susan Arrington asks, have you thought about doing storage auctions? No, <laughs> I have never, ever, ever considered doing storage auctions and I'll tell you why. You might've heard me mention before that I'm kind of lazy. I really am. You guys think that I'm silly when I say I'm lazy, but no, I am legit lazy. And storage auctions are way too much manual labor. I do not like manual labor, never have. I don't even like doing housework. You think I wanna clean up someone's old storage locker with all of their dust and crap? Heck no. I would rather get boxes of pretty things delivered to me. I don't wanna have to go through a hoarder's closet. I'm sorry, that's just personal preference. Alexis Delgadillo asks, hi, Lindy. Hello, Alexis. Love your videos. Thank you so much. You have inspired me to grow my business. I'm still a little confused about regional shipping. Can you please explain again? Okay, so I have a video all about the regional boxes. I'll link it up here. I'll put it down in the video description and I'll pin it to the top pinned comment in the comment section as well. Trying to think of the easiest way to describe them without making it super confusing. There's two different kinds. There's a regional A and there's a regional B. And then there's two styles of each of those. There's the side loader and the top loader. So there's technically two boxes that qualify for regional A, two boxes that qualify for regional B. And regional boxes kind of operate like a flat rate box in, in a sense. So a regional A box ships at a two pound weight and a regional B box ships at a four pound weight. So it's kind of like pretending whatever you put in a regional A box only weighs two pounds, even if it weighs more. And anything you put in a regional B box only weighs four pounds, even if it weighs more. So the amount that you pay for those boxes can still vary depending on how far away your buyer is, but there is a cap to the amount of weight that you pay for. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever used a regional B box. It's never saved any money, but the regional A boxes save me money all the time. If I was gonna tell you to pick one, I would say get the side loader regional A box because I feel like the side loader fits a little bit more stuff inside, but the top loader is equally as good. But check out the video that I did fully explaining how the regional boxes worked. Again, they're linked down below. I am missing some coffee. How can I do this video without coffee? All right, what we got here? Danielle Kalkenmark asks, have you noticed an increase in sourcing costs since quarter four started? So I have not personally noticed a cost in inventory since the start of Q4. Uh, nor have I really noticed a price increase previous years. When I saw a huge spike in the cost of goods came when the pandemic first started. There's a couple of different reasons why I suspect there was such a huge price increase in inventory when the pandemic first began. I think the very first thing that was noticed was an influx of buyers coming to liquidation sites and wholesalers and wanting to buy inventory. And I think that it was so much that was noticed that there was an instant price increase because a lot of companies can increase prices where they see demand, obviously. And then just from speaking to a couple of people that run some liquidation companies that I personally purchase from, I talked to a few people in those industries. And what they told me was that there was also an increase in price 
for them. So of course, we all own businesses. We all know that when we have an increase in price, then a lot of the times we have to raise our prices and pass those prices along to our customers because we have to compensate for fee increases or pricing increases so that we can keep our businesses afloat. And what I learned from some of my contacts at these liquidation companies is that there was an overall pricing increase when it came to trucks because there was a shortage of supply because warehouses were closing down, distributors were closing down, and when there's not as much supply and a lot more demand, obviously prices are going to increase. So a lot of these companies saw increases, therefore having to raise their prices and all of that. But as a general rule, I don't really see a pricing increase for Q4 specifically. Where I do see pricing increases for Q4 is definitely when there's auctions involved. When there are auctions involved and you're having to bid on lots like with liquidation.com, of course there's going to be pricing increases because there's more people trying to get inventory for quarter four and that automatically drives bids up. Missy Watkins asks, how often do you go through listings for expired items? I go through once a month. I can't remember if I've gone into much detail about this in one of these videos before, but what I will do is I will put the expiration date at the end of any listing that has an expiration date and about 10 days to two weeks before the end of the month, so right around the middle of the month. So coming up here very soon, I am going to be searching all of my active listings for 11 slash 2020. That's going to be for all of my listings that expire at the end of November 2020. And then I'll be able to see at a glance how many listings I have that are still available for sale that expire at the end of this month. And then from there, what I'll be able to do is I'll be able to go in and lower prices if I need to try to sell them off faster, or I can go do an audit of my inventory and see if all of the remaining quantities expire at the end of this month. If the if all of the quantities don't expire at the end of this month, then I'll just go in and I will edit the listing and I will change the quantity to reflect how many I have left that don't expire at the end of this month, and I'll just coffee's done. And I will just take the items that are about ready to expire out and I will edit the listing and change the expiration date to reflect the ones that I still have in stock. If I only have stuff that's going to expire, I will most definitely change the price to try to get them to sell faster. And then about two days before the end of the month, I'll do that same search again and make sure to pull the listings down that are about ready to expire so that they don't accidentally sell. Tracy Kenny asks, what is an organization hack that you can share to maximize inventory storage? I don't know if it's a hack, but it's a suggestion. I highly recommend storing all of your small inventory in banker boxes rather than those big Sterilite totes. Now, I used to use those big Sterilite totes when I sold clothing, and the one thing that was really noticeable about those Sterilite totes is that they would get very, very heavy. And I could never fit those giant totes on a shelf in a way that made the space on the shelf made sense. There was always too much space left above the tote or there was never enough space on the shelf to accommodate fitting the tote in. Ooh, I made that really full. Stir it very carefully. Don't spill. Oh, it's hot. Ooh. I can't carry it in the other room yet unless I want it to spill all over me. So we're just gonna wait right here. But what I love about the banker boxes is that they are a really small manageable size. And so it's really hard to fill them so full that they're really heavy and too heavy to navigate. The banker boxes also stack up very, very easily. And depending on the kind of shelving you have, you can adjust the shelves to fit a lot of banker boxes on one shelving unit. Or if you don't have as many shelves and you have really big spaces, you can almost slide two of the banker boxes on top of themselves inside one single shelf. So depending on the kind of shelving unit you have, you can fit a lot more banker boxes versus those really big oversized like 50 quart totes. The banker boxes are also super easy to stack. So if you don't have a lot of shelving units or if you start getting more inventory that you're holding on to that you haven't been able to sell yet, you can actually stack banker boxes in the corner of your house. You could fit like 20 banker boxes boxes stacked up in the corner of a room and they are completely out of the way. They're so small, they can stack so high. And I think they're rated for like 
30, 40, 50 pounds, something like that, depending on the kind of banker boxes that you buy. I'll go ahead and link the exact ones that I use down below, but I will tell you they are the cheapest to buy at Walmart. You can get a 10 pack of banker boxes at Walmart for like 20 bucks. If you go to Amazon, you are definitely going to be paying more. So I highly recommend going into Walmart and buying bundles of banker boxes because that is by far the cheapest place I've been able to see. I think Sam's Club has an even better deal if you have a Sam's Club membership. But the banker boxes I think are the best organizational hack that I have because of their size and how many you can fit in an area. Not only are they more manageable because of size and weight, but it also makes it a lot easier to find your inventory after it sells because the banker boxes don't hold a ton. It's really easy to just like open up the box, look in and see what you're looking for so you can pull stuff for shipping a lot faster. Ah, hot, I keep burning my tongue, so impatient. Sheila Polito asks, hi, Lindy. Hello, Sheila. Love all of the helpful information today. Thank you so much. Twice daily, I access my eBay account. I check for sales, bulk edit all of my listings, and then check and correct the trending promotion rates. I have even checked my pricing. It's been seven plus days since my last sale. I'm getting nervous about selling. I also, Oh, I have also updated all of the recommended item specifics. I am listing 20 to 30 items each week. What more can I do to increase my presence and page views? I do not have a store because I don't have the sales to support one. Okay, so Sheila, one of the first things that I noticed when I read through your comment, well, first of all, first of all, before I give you my opinion of what you can do to increase sales, first I just wanna say, you're not the only one experiencing slow sales here. Just on Monday, I you know disclosed to you guys in my live stream that I've probably had one of the worst weekends I've had in a really long time. And I think that it's just the current state of everything going on right now. There's a lot of uncertainty. I don't know if people are shopping. I think people are more focused on watching what's going on in the world and what's going on in our country. And I think that people are also holding on to their money a little bit because they don't know what's gonna happen with stimulus, yada, yada, yada. There's all of this stuff going on that I think is really keeping people from shopping right now. So all of that being said, I think that one of the things that you are not doing because you can't do it because you don't have a store is you're not running sales. I notice a huge difference in the amount of sales that I get when I'm running a markdown manager sale in my eBay store. Without a doubt, if I have a noticeable dip in my sales, it will be because I forgot to start a new markdown manager promotion. Mm. That's good. And unfortunately, you can only run these markdown manager sales if you have a store subscription. So. I don't wanna tell you go get an eBay store subscription just so that you can run markdown sales, especially because in your question, you stated that you don't have the sales to support it. I totally get that. However, I am a very, very firm believer and if you are going to make eBay selling a legitimate business and you are going to continue to do it. You're not just gonna sell one thing here, one thing there. And it doesn't sound like you're that way. I mean, you said that you're listing 20 to 30 items a week. It really sounds like you're wanting to make, you know, having an eBay business an actual income for yourself of some kind, whether it's supplementing some form of income, part-time, full-time, whatever it is you're wanting to do with eBay, it sounds like you're wanting to make it a legit business. And if you're wanting to make it a legit business, I do highly recommend a at least a basic store subscription because that will at least give you the ability to run markdown sales. And they haven't really confirmed it, but it has been suggested that people that have store subscriptions do have better visibility. Again, that is not something that is confirmed um, and it's not something that's necessary. I keep using my dad as an example every once in a while. My dad has been on eBay for well over 20 years now. He does very, very well with it and he has never had a store subscription ever. He makes it work, but sometimes depending on the kind of items you're selling, you need the extra push of better visibility or the extra push of running markdown sales and so on and so forth. So if you do a 12 month commitment, it's $22 a month for a basic store subscription. If you don't want a commitment, it's I think $27.95. So $28 a month for a basic store subscription without a commitment. I don't know if maybe you want to try without a commitment and pay $28 a month for a couple of months and try running some sales and see if you get some better traction, maybe try that. I just, I'm never a fan of telling someone to jump into getting a store if they're not financially ready for it. 
I just know how much of a benefit running markdown sales has on my own personal store. So if you're really struggling with getting the sales, that would be the number one thing I tell you to try. But again, it's a $28 commitment every 30 days with, without a long-term commitment. It's just $28 a month for as long as you want to do it. It's not a big deal to switch your store over. You just subscribe to a store and then all of your listings import automatically. So that would be the first thing that I tell you to try. But again, don't be super concerned with not having any sales for a little bit, especially if you don't have a ton of merchandise listed for sale, like if you don't have over a hundred things listed, I wouldn't be too concerned just because of the state of everything going on right now. Okay, this is cool enough. I can go walk with it now. Okay, here we go. Oh, this feels so much more cozy. Oh, now it's even more cozy because I got a puppy. I got two puppies. Hi, oh, who's a good boy? Can't get much cozier than this. Joyce Speck asks, Someone had asked about your hours for eBay. With all of the time that you spend on sourcing, all platforms you sell on, shipping, social media, everything that you do this business related, would you say that you do 40 or more hours a week? 40 or more hours. Um, I think if I were being truly 100% transparent and honest, I would say it probably pushes 40 hours a week. But then again, a part of me doesn't want to say that it's 40 hours a week because it doesn't feel like 40 hours a week. If I had to put an exact time on it, I would say it would be about 30 hours because that's approximately how many hours I have to work while Benjamin is at school. You know, I do have my oldest son, but he's in high school. He kind of takes care of himself and does his own thing. So the only child that I have that kind of inhibits my ability to get work done is my five-year-old who is in kindergarten. And he's in school about 30 hours a week. But then again, I don't always get to work 100% of the time he's at school. Sometimes I have appointments that I have to do. Sometimes Sometimes I have things at home I need to take care of. Sometimes I take a long lunch and I go have lunch with my mom. Oh, look, look at this, look at this puppy. You guys can't see. Look at this puppy. He's just, hi, Bo Bear. Mm. He's like heaven. He's like heaven. Mm. Yeah, ever since we moved to the new house, they like to poop on the carpet. I'm not very happy about that. And then there are times where I'm like finishing editing a video while I have dinner in the oven or I might try to squeeze in listing just five more things while Benjamin plays on his tablet or swings on the swing outside my office window. So there are times where I try to squeeze in work after those hours, but it doesn't feel like a ton of work time because maybe it's 20 minutes here, 15 minutes there, 30 minutes there. You know, if I take 20 minutes to reply to YouTube comments, or if I take 15 minutes to post a few affiliate marketing links to Pinterest, you know, all of these different things, it doesn't really feel like work. So I feel like I have a 30 hour work week. That's what feels like work to me, but if you add up all of those other little bits of time that I spend, it's probably closer to 40 hours, but it is not much more than that. Uh, I, I, I would be really pushed to say that I, it's 40 hours or more. I think it's probably pushing 40 hours, but even then, it, I don't even think it's close to 40 hours. I think it's more like 30 because I try my best not to work at all when kids aren't in school. Trisha Retzlaff asks, what would cause you to quit your business? I might quit if profit margins just completely went away because profit margins on the items that I like to source are pretty slim as it is. And if the markets keep going down on the kind of items that I sell and the shipping prices keep going up and then the cost of inventory continues to go up, then I will have no choice but to quit. However, all of that being said, I don't anticipate that happening for a really long time, if ever. Because I like to feel like I'm pretty resourceful and I'll figure it out because I truly, truly love selling. I feel like I have it in my blood. It's always been the kind of person I am. I know I've told you guys before the stories of when I was a kid, I sold a Kleenex box full of rocks at a yard sale for five bucks. You know, I used to make friendship bracelets and pedal them off of my front porch. I sold baseball cards out of my desk when I was in third grade for 10 cents a piece. I am a born entrepreneur. It's in my blood. And if the kind of merchandise I'm selling stopped being profitable because of shipping or inventory increases, or 
the market dropped out from under me. I would probably just find something else to sell because it's in me, it's who I am, it's what I do. So it would take a lot for me to just quit. Lucy Smith asks, what happens if you overcharge postage cost? Does it really matter? You keep it. Yeah, if you overcharge postage, no big deal, just keep it. The buyer knows what they're paying when they commit to the purchase, so they shouldn't be mad at you. They won't even know, they wouldn't even know. Angela asks, thank you, Lindy, for all of your awesome videos. They've helped me out so much. Thank you, Angela. My store is doing pretty good, but I need to expand it quicker and I don't have the capital readily available. Have you ever thought about taking out a small business loan in order to grow your business faster? Trying to decide if this would be a smart move or if it would just add more stress to increase debt. So I have taken out a loan before to purchase inventory. I took out a PayPal working capital loan in order to purchase two pallets of clothing from Via Trading back in 2018. And what I will tell you is it did nothing but add stress. So I'm not a huge fan of debt anyway, and I had decided that I wanted to try getting pallets of clothing to try to grow my eBay store at the time into a store that had merchandise that had higher quality stuff versus just flipping used thrift store goods. I wanted to try having items that were brand new with tags that were worth a little bit more money. And I did not like that so much of the money that I made had to go immediately to paying off that debt. I didn't like that debt hanging over my head. And it was only about $4,000. And again, I say only $4,000. $4,000 is a huge amount of money to so many people. I know that it makes me sound tone deaf to just say, oh, it's just $4,000 and I was so stressed out about it. But $4,000 is a lot of money, especially when you have to pay it back over a certain amount of time and you have this obligation and you're still trying to grow a business because you said in your question, and at the time it was the same for me too, I was trying to grow a business, but I believe it is extremely difficult to grow a business when you're constantly having to make debt payments. It's really hard to grow a business when you owe people money. So my word of advice to you would be just to keep snowballing all of your profits as long as possible, because I feel like that's going to be the best way for you to grow your business. And it's not going to be as stressful as if you're having to make debt payments. Payments. Oh no, my battery's gonna die and I'm not done yet. Stand by. And we're back. Mike C asks, do you still find it worth the time to sell on Amazon by merch or has it become too flooded with other sellers to make anything worthwhile? So if you are unfamiliar with Amazon merch, Amazon merch is print on demand. It's basically where you create t-shirt designs and you upload them into Amazon's website and they will print the design on t-shirts as people buy them and then you as the creator of the design earn a royalty commission. So I haven't been putting a lot of effort into Amazon merch lately, not just because I'm super busy with a lot of other projects, but because it is so highly competitive, you really do have to watch your designs and you have to watch the market almost on a daily basis because there are programs out there that help designers find the best selling designs so that they can copycat them and market them as their own. And of course, any design that you upload into Amazon Merch, you do have certain copyright or trademarks that you can file. However, unless you own a physical copyright of a certain phrase or a certain design that you yourself have created, you really have no stance in another creator coming through and using your same wordage and just changing the design a little bit and making it their own and making it better than you and selling more shirts than you sell. It is highly, highly competitive and it is also super cutthroat. There's also a paid subscription site called Merch Informer where you can go in and you can search certain phrases and you can see what the top selling t-shirts are and essentially rip off those designs. So can you make a lot of money selling Amazon? on merch, absolutely you can, but it has to almost be the dominant thing that you pay attention to. You have to watch for designs daily. You have to constantly be tweaking and updating and watching the markets. You have to be watching trends to see what people might wanna buy. It's really, really involved and I just don't have that kind of time. Wayne Stewart asks, Lindy, when you are listing your HBA products, which strategy seems to work best for you? Number one, lower price plus shipping. Number two, higher price, free shipping, 
Or number three, combination method, thanks. So because I truly believe that this is how e-commerce is moving, I do almost everything free shipping. The only time that I will charge shipping to my buyers is if I have an item that weighs over a pound and it will not fit in a regional box. If it fits in a flat rate envelope of any kind, if it fits in a regional A box, if it's going first class, I will do free shipping and just put the higher price with the free shipping. But if it's over a pound and doesn't fit in any of those shipping service packages, then I will charge shipping to the buyer. And I do that because I do feel like we are living in a world where people expect free shipping. I also believe that having your listing as free shipping helps you appear higher in search on the eBay search page. CM3 asks, how long into selling online did you start using Wholesale Ninjas? Thanks, Lindy. So let's see here. I started selling back in 2006. So I sold thrifted or inventory that I bought from yard sales or Craigslist. I did all of that kind of sourcing until 2018. So that's roughly 12 years. Uh, when I started getting into liquidation, I started with you know the major site bulk. I also started with liquidation.com and I sourced with a few different places for about a year before I found Wholesale Ninjas. Like I mentioned, I found Wholesale Ninjas towards the end of 2019 and been sourcing with them ever since. So I guess to answer your question, I was sourcing liquidation for about a year when I found Wholesale Ninjas, but I was selling for 12 to 13 years before that. Letitia Blake asks, Hi, and I love your videos. Hello. I'm just getting back into reselling and my 19 year old wants to help me. I'm not sure what I should have him start doing. What would you suggest I start him out doing? So it's funny I got this question because I've been thinking about having my almost 15 year old start helping me because he's starting to get to that age where he wants an after school job. And I was going to have my high schooler start out by doing things like sorting goods, and shipping because I feel like sorting, getting your hands on stuff, getting a feel for what's out there, conditions, things like that. I feel like that's a really good way to get started. And then of course the act of shipping, pulling things, getting things weighed, packaging things, putting shipping labels on, that kind of stuff. And then of course the next thing I would have him do is listing. Listing is a little bit more involved and you do need to spend a lot of time going over the listing process to make sure the listings are done correctly, to make sure that pricing is good, unless you just want to have him save drafts and then you can go in and do all of your pricing. If you have a 19 year old, chances are they are pretty well experienced with a lot of different aspects. So you might wanna just have them jump in and start doing listing. Now I wouldn't have them do the listing in its entirety, but you can definitely have them start a draft and put a lot of the basic information in the draft and just just save it and then you can go into the listing and you could double check the work, make sure that the shipping information is correct, make sure that it's priced accordingly and then you can be the one to send the listing live. Lissa Morris asks, I am so scared to try the liquidation angle. I've been a one-off person for 20 years. You have me strongly thinking about liquidation. I too struggle with self-doubt constantly. But now more than ever, I have to struggle for every crumb I can possibly get. I so appreciate your time and effort in all of this. So here's the deal with liquidation. You are absolutely validated with being scared of it. I would never want to put forth the illusion that buying liquidation is easy and it's a surefire way to get stuff that'll make you money. Keep having to shift around because my butt's starting to fall asleep. Ow see me do some yoga poses. I'm just gonna answer the rest of the question like this. Oh, I think that's making it worse. So I would never wanna give the illusion that it's super duper easy to just go out, find a liquidation order, and then just suddenly get all of these items that are gonna sell and make you a ton of money because that's not how it works. Liquidation is very scary because there's no guarantees with liquidation. You can buy, and I have bought pallets and spent thousands of dollars for garbage, just literal garbage that couldn't be sold. I was lucky if I could sell anything out of it for a couple hundred bucks at a yard sale. But then also with that high risk comes high reward. So it's really just a matter of when you are ready to risk the money. I always tell you guys, 
Never, ever, ever spend money on liquidation that you cannot afford to lose. You only have $100 and it's the last $100 you have. Do not spend that money on liquidation because Murphy's Law, a wonderful Murphy's Law, if something bad can go wrong, it will. And if you risk the only bit of money that you have on something that's high risk, you're inviting Murphy into your house. Don't do that. There's a reason why I did not start liquidation until my 14th year of reselling. It's because oh, over the last decade, I would never have spent thousands of dollars on liquidation. I didn't have the guts to do it. It was only when I had the experience sourcing one-offs and going to thrift stores and yard sales and I kept rolling and rolling and rolling my profits into a sizable enough capital to where I was comfortable risking it. You know, back in 2015 and 2016, when I did start flipping personal care stuff, I wasn't getting it from liquidation. I was buying it off of Facebook Marketplace from couponers. I belonged to several different Facebook groups with a bunch of couponers that were selling off their stockpile stash, and I would buy it from couponers and I would flip it on eBay that way. In 2015 and 16, I did not have the cojones to go drop a thousand dollars on an HBA pallet. Wasn't gonna happen. It was only when I was comfortable lighting that money on fire, essentially, did I finally start buying liquidation. So if your gut is telling you you're not ready, don't do it. Jean Mueller asks, Hi, hello Jean. I've watched your videos on shipping and how to do it cheaper. Have you ever heard of box in a bag? Do we have to acknowledge that the box is in the bag in order to get the box in bag rate? This is confusing. Thanks for sharing all of your knowledge with us. So in my video that I have that's talking about how to ship heavy items cheap, again, I'll link it up here and down in the video description and in the pinned comment, I refer to the box in the bag method that pirate ship allows you to have. You do not have to actually have a box inside of a bag in order to qualify for that rate. If you are just shipping something that is going into a bag, you can still select that option. It doesn't actually have to be a box in a bag. I think that's just how they worded it to let you know that it was okay to cover a box with the bag in order to get that rate but really any bag. And also I wanted to take this moment to answer a question that I do get a lot on that video. And that is what if you just wanna ship something in a bubble mailer or a bag of some kind? Yes, select that option. You don't have to use any special packaging. You don't have to use a special kind of envelope. You can use the Scotch Flex and Seal shipping rule that I always talk about with that. That is something that I think a lot of people don't understand. I love that Scotch Flex and Seal shipping rule. If you don't know what that is, is. I'll link it down below. I also have a video where I review it. I'll link that up here and also down, I'll put it down in the pinned comment in the video description. The Scotch Flex and Seal shipping roll is incredible. You're basically making your own custom size bubble mailer and it's amazing. It sticks to itself. You create your own packaging to fit whatever item you need to ship. That also qualifies for box in a bag. It's not technically a bag, it's not technically a box, but it qualifies. So if you have something small and heavy and you want to cover it with the Scotch Flex and Seal shipping roll, you can still use that box in a bag option on Pirate Ship to save even more money on shipping. Tim Jones II asks, how easy is it to transition from one niche to another? I followed you for a while and I've watched you transition from selling mostly jeans to now focusing on health and beauty. It is not an easy switch. Let me just say that. When you make any super dramatic switch on eBay, there is a transition period because eBay doesn't know what to do. As a seller in your eBay account, you are developing a relevancy and you're developing trust on the eBay site. eBay wants to be able to predict what its sellers are gonna do. And when you do a real shock to the system, when you switch the kind of merchandise you're selling, when you shift everything to free shipping or you shift everything to charge shipping, if you shift all of your prices in a moment's notice, it's a shock to the system and it's unpredictable and eBay doesn't necessarily like that. So when I made the switch from clothing, mostly jeans to selling health and beauty, I wiped my store almost completely clear. 
I went from like six or 700 listings down to 50. And I started listing a whole bunch of stuff that was completely different from the stuff that I had been selling over the last couple of years. And it took a really good amount of time. I want to say about six months or so for eBay to realize what I was doing and start to give me visibility in those categories that I was unfamiliar with in my history. So if you do make a huge shift, just know it's not going to be an instantaneous shift. You might see a dip in sales. You might see your visibility go down a lot and it's just because you have to reclaim that relevancy and you have to reclaim all of that trust that you had previously built up with eBay but it's not impossible it just takes a little bit of time and you can do it all right is everybody ready to find out the next winner of the free 100 count liquidation lot from wholesale ninjas drum roll please the winner chosen by random comment selection is Barb Knight. Congratulations, Barb. I have replied to your comment. Just get with me and I will make sure that you receive your free lot from Wholesale Ninjas. Barb asks, do you save items without an expiration that aren't worth listing to later put at a yard sale to at least break even. Yes. If I have an item that I receive in liquidation that is not really worth the time listing, maybe it's $5 and under market price, or maybe the item itself doesn't have a lot of value when you factor shipping into it. There could be a whole lot of reasons why it's not worth listing. Maybe there's damage. Maybe there's no desire to buy it online. I will simply put those items aside and I will either sell them as a mixed box on Facebook Marketplace or I'll stick them in a box and I'll sell them at a yard sale. Or if it's something like cosmetics and I have some cosmetics that have broken seals or they've been tested and I can't list them online, I will just keep a box of cosmetics in my closet and when the box gets full, I'll just sell it for 50 bucks on Facebook Marketplace and market it as testers or makeup for little girls to play with, something like that. And that always does really well. Now you have to take into consideration that you're not going to be making money off of this. You're basically selling this stuff at a loss, but it's to at least get some cash flow back into your business. Because if you didn't sell something for 50 cents at a yard sale, you would just be taking a loss and getting nothing for it. I would rather sell a box of 50 damaged personal care items to somebody for 25 bucks versus not getting anything for it at all. Not only that, but the person that's buying that from you is probably really, really appreciative appreciative that you're giving them such a good deal. So I feel like it does some good. It gives you a little bit of cash flow back. It's absolutely my way of looking at it. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of Frequently Asked Fridays. If you liked this video, please do remember to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and ring the notification bell. That way you're notified whenever I post a new video. The next episode of Frequently Asked Fridays will be posted on Friday, December the 4th. We are skipping a week because of Thanksgiving. So if you don't see the episode two Fridays from now, that is why. But that also gives you an extra week to submit your question down in the comment section to be featured on the next episode and to possibly win a free 100 count lot from Wholesale Ninjas, just like Barb did on this episode. Don't forget to check the video description. I'll put a bunch of useful information in there. Everything that I referenced in this video will be in the video description. It'll also be in the top pinned comment of the comment section. Thank you guys again so much for watching this episode of Frequently Asked Fridays, and I will see you guys with my next video. Bye-bye.